first type of trust we're going to talk about is the express trust. And this tends to be the easiest one to understand. The textbook or the, su the subject guide that you have uh, says that an express trust is one that is sort of pushed out intentionally into the world. I think they use a tube of toothpaste as a metaphor. I've never heard that before. Um, I always think of express trust as something that is simply, it's an expression of the trustee's wishes or the settler's wishes rather. What is true of an express trust is that the settler, so the person giving the property away, means to create a trust. They may not use the word trust, they may not know that technically they're creating a trust, but they know that they are giving property rights or rights in their property away. Then they do it deliberately. There's a lot of discussion about express trusts. So what I'm going to do is basically create a scenario and we're going to talk through what would have how you create an express trust in this scenario or what what happens when you create an express trust. So let's have our characters. Let's say we have an elderly man called John. And John has a sister called Jane who he's looked after a lot of her, Jane's life. He's the older brother. She's, let's say she's widowed. And John pays some money towards Jane's upkeep. And let's say John is a landlord, so he owns several properties. And as John gets older, he decides that he wants to continue making sure that his sister has an income. But he's getting too old to manage these properties by himself. And maybe he wants to give the properties away. He doesn't want to manage them anymore. Maybe he wants to, as is often the case, when he dies, avoid inheritance tax on that property passing to Jane. So he wants to make provision for her if he dies first. So he wants to give Jane the house. But Jane is also elderly and maybe isn't going to be able to, let's say, collect the rent from the tenants in that house. So instead, he gives it to his niece, Jane's daughter, Mary. And Mary is trustee of the house for her mother, Jane. And this means that as far as the law is concerned, Mary owns the property. But if Mary did something with the property that wasn't in Jane's best interest, so she didn't she didn't collect in the rent properly from the tenants or instead of letting tenants live there, Mary moved her and her family and herself and didn't pay her mother rent. Then Mary would be in breach of her duties as a trustee. So if John just gave Mary the house, Mary could move in, she could get rid of the tenants, she could charge what she wanted in rent, it would be her house. And the law's perspective on what Mary's saying, Mary's rights hasn't changed. What has changed when John gives it to Mary to hold as trustee, is equity's perspective on what needs to happen with that house. And equity says that Mary needs to administer the house, needs to rent it out, needs to use it in a way that benefits her mother. And we'll talk, if you need me to, we'll talk a bit more about trustees' duties at another day. But what we're talking about is the concept of an express trust. So John's created an express trust. He's the settler. It might have been that John could have been trustee as well, but maybe he doesn't want to be. There are different types of express trust. Um, one type of express trust is a bear trust. And a bear trust is when something is put on trust, but the settler really doesn't give, for whatever reason, doesn't give any extra information, direct how the trust is meant to be used all they do is give the property away and say for the benefit of this person where you find it in practice is sometimes if people give property away to children but because in the UK you can't hold your own property until you're 18 essentially it's held by the parents on bear trust or the guardians whoever the legal guardians are hold it on bear trust for the child. That's a really common use of a, of a bear trust. And they hold it, once that child becomes 18, then the property is just held to the order of that child. And when we say held to the order, basically 
child can either say, I want you to rent out the house, invest the money, or they can say, I want you to give the money to me. And the trustee really has no power to disobey. What John has probably done is created what the subject guide terms as a special trust. And I've used that term. It's not one I've used before, but it's quite a good term to say, you know, you've got bear trust and you've got special trusts and bear trusts. They're bare of any instructions. Special trusts are going to have more conditions attached to what the trustee can and can't do with the property. So the special trust is going to be more complex and you can have, let's say, a fixed trust. And a fixed trust, if John would create a fixed trust, he might say, here you go, Mary, here's the house. I want you to hold it for your mother, Jane. And that's a fixed trust. Jane has a fixed interest in the income that is produced by that house. She has a fixed interest if they sell the house and the money that is made selling the house. Otherwise, there might be what's called a discretionary trust. So John may give the house to Mary and say, there are, you can choose whether to give the income to Jane or to my children, your cousins. And that's a discretionary trust. Mary has a pot of money and she needs to distribute it between the beneficiaries, but she gets to choose often when and how much, depending on what John has specifically said. And that's a discretionary trust. And you've also got trusts where you've got mixed, fixed and discretionary. So it might be fixed in the sense of John says, okay, Mary, here's the house. And I want you to hold it for your mother, Jane, for all of Jane's lifetime. And when Jane dies, I want you to distribute as you see fit the proceeds of the sale of the house between my children. So for a while, there's a fixed interest. Jane has that fixed interest. And then once that ends, that's Mary then has discretion. And in that sense, we call, there's another word for that, and that's Jane having a life interest. Um, and it's a, that's, that's quite a common thing to do, where you see it quite often is in people who want to, let's say, a wife dies and she owns a house and she wants to leave it, she wants to leave the house to her children, but she's been married several times. So she leaves or she married later in life. So she leaves the house to her husband so her husband can continue living in it after his death. But she doesn't want him to be able to leave it to his children. She wants to leave it to her children. So she creates a life interest in the property. And once he, her husband dies after her, then it, the property goes to her children. That's a really common use of a life interest trust. In that scenario, we say that, let's say, John's children have a contingent interest. So they don't have an interest that starts as soon as the trust is created. It is contingent, so it depends on a certain event happening. And in that case, it is contingent on Jane's death, and then the children have an interest in the property. Now, that can be a fixed interest or a discretionary interest, but it's a contingent interest if they have it after Jane dies. There's also another kind of interest that you can have, which is a defeasible interest. Um, And that's an interest that ends at a certain event. So Jane might have a defeasible interest that ends on her death, but it could be something else. So John might say that he wants his sister to take the income of the the trust. So take the income that's generated by the rent uh, until she has 5 million shillings uh, worth of rent and then her interest stops and his children's interest starts. So then Mary has to distribute the rent to his children. And Jane in that scenario has a defeasible interest. So that's an express trust. 